Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice. Through interviews, discussions, and music, your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your hosts, Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. We've been on a bit of a winter hiatus, but are back now at the end of Lent and into the Easter season with a great lineup of topics and guests. Our guest today, Dr. William Mart, Associate Professor at Stanford University, the President of the Church Music Association of America, and Editor of Sacred Music, will help us better understand the music theory undergirding Gregorian chant with an aim at helping us better understand the meaning of the chant. Before we get to the interview, though, I would like to draw your attention to the fantastic and exciting lineup of summer sacred music courses that we are teaching through St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers, New York. We're offering eight different courses in sacred music and the liturgy, all on different schedules, and all are available online at an unbeatably low price this summer. Principles of Sacred Music is an overview of the history of sacred music, church documents, and practical issues in sacred music programs that aims to help musicians and clergy think with the church about sacred music. Principles of Chant is a sort of zero to 60 approach to singing Gregorian chant. By the end of the week, you'll be comfortable singing most any piece and even directing a scola. Teaching Gregorian chant to children is great for Catholic school teachers and parents who want to study pedagogical approaches to teaching the church's treasury of sacred music to young people. The course focuses on the first level of the Ward method of music education. Intro to Liturgy will explore the theological, historical, and pastoral dimensions of the sacred liturgy and help students form an approach to liturgical scholarship that benefits their future study and work in the church. And we have four new courses this summer, too, that we're really excited to present. On Monday and Wednesday evenings, beginning June 3rd, I'll teach a course entitled Sacred Music History Seminar and Practicum, the Liturgical Movement and Sacred Music Renewal 1800 to 1950. Drawing on the rich writings of the liturgical movement and the intensive activity to renew sacred music during the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, the seminar will offer an in-depth study of historical documents, spiritual writings, and pieces from the church's treasury of sacred music with an eye to improving our prayer lives and implementing musical repertoire from this period into parish use. Tuesday nights will feature Parish Sacred Music Program Management, a great class for any musician or member of the clergy who is looking for inspiration and ideas as they work to expand or make changes to an existing sacred music program. Later on in the summer, July 28th to 30th, Professor Charles Weaver from Juilliard will teach medieval and Renaissance music notation practicum, helping students understand a number of different types of notation so that they can intelligently perform this music and make their own additions from manuscripts. And finally, from July 19th to 23rd, we'll feature a class by today's guest, Dr. Mart, entitled Advanced Seminar in Gregorian Chant, in which Dr. Mart will present various approaches to analyzing and understanding the meaning of chant, all with the goal of developing our spiritual lives and artistic performance of chant in parishes and schools. You can go to our website, sacredmusicpodcast.com, and click on Upcoming Events to find this information, or visit St. Joseph's Seminary's website at dunwoody.edu, and that's spelled D-U-N-W-O-O-D-I-E dot E-D-U to access the brochure and find out more. There is a 50% tuition discount for all musicians who obtain a letter of support from their pastor, and registration is open now. And now, my latest interview with Dr. William Mart. Bill, thanks so much for coming back on to the show. We loved having you on in the first season, and we're happy to have you back on. I'm happy to be here. So, our topic today is modality in Gregorian chant. And generally speaking, and not yet specifying it in the context of Gregorian chant. Could you explain what a mode is? A mode is a system of pitch relationships in which each pitch has its own function. That is to say, we can define the final and the reciting note particularly, and these then have a whole series of pitches in relationship to them, that is to say, a scale, so that you have four finals, D, E, F, and G, and they have scales that 
are the equivalent of the white notes on the keyboard. As well, uh, you have, for each final, you have two ambitus, that is to say, two kinds of range, authentic and plagal. An authentic ambitus gives you essentially the octave above the final, so D to D. The plagal ambitus gives you a fourth below and a fifth below, above. So around the D final, you have A to A. Those are the, uh, the, the basics of, uh, of the modes, and they're not unlike the keys in, in more recent music, but there are many interesting differences which we can talk about. So that's the, those, those are the basic things about what a mode is. Right. So within those pitch collections, there's a sort of hierarchy, right? And yes. why does that hierarchy matter? You know, how, is, how does it make music sound different in a hierarchical structure controlled by modes as opposed to in, for example, 12-tone music in the 20th century in which this hierarchy is eliminated, you know, and every, every pitch is equal? What does a hierarchy of tones do for the singer and for the listener? So it orients the singer and the listener to a, a, a central uh, focal point. And the reason it is valuable is because our lives have hierarchies. For any given mode, there is the final and the reciting note, as well as what I call a chain of thirds. That is, D, F, A, C uh, forms a, a, a pitch structure that all of the finals relate to in one way or another so that every mode has a slightly different sense of uh, the hierarchy. But hierarchies are crucial because we experience hierarchies in our lives. Uh, we watch uh, plants grow and plants move. We see seasons change. There's a hierarchy between all of these things. And music represents this sort of purposeful relationship of things in our lives that as well then are purposeful relationships between the pitches of the pieces of music. The 12-tone system in which there is no hierarchy essentially failed. Nobody composes in that anymore except for academic composers. Or maybe as a sort of compositional experiment while you're learning. Yes, that's right. It's taught, it's taught to students, but uh, it, it doesn't, I, I don't think it produces uh, music that people listen to anymore much. Some maybe, but, and there are some beautiful pieces that are written in the 12 tone uh, system, but um, they're beautiful because <laughs> the system doesn't work. There are still hierarchies in it. So you would say that beauty is dependent on that hierarchy and that it gives a sense of ordered movement and a sort of talos to the pitches that you hear, that you're not just meandering meaninglessly. Exactly. You, you have a sense of both order and purpose in the way the piece progresses and arrives on the final or the tonic, if you were speaking of tonal music. And so this also brings up the question of what harmony is in Gregorian chant. You know, that, that word is used, even though when we, in our modern time, think of harmony, we think of maybe a chord, and that is simultaneously sounding pitches. But still, harmony exists in Gregorian chant through this hierarchy and also what you're talking about in this sort of chain of thirds, that things move with a sort of underlying relationship and the link between those notes, even though it's stretched out over time and you don't hear them all at once, it still has a sense of um, moving away from home and back to home in a sort of way that um, tonal harmony does, right? Well, that's right. And moreover, there is a sense of the harmonious relationship between each two pitches. So you sing D to F, and those two have a particular harmonious relationship that can be described in terms of proportions, or F to A can be described in the proportion, or say D to A can be described in the proportion of two to one, or F to A in the proportion of four to three. Uh, 
And it's those proportions which are the foundation of harmony. And those, those foundations are also acoustical because you have the overtone series, which is present in the sounding of any pitch, so that the pitches that are being sounded, there, there's a complex of pitches that are harmonious, that relate one to the other by proportion, and they sound as a component of those pitches, but when two pitches are sounded even in succession, one hears the relationship of those pitches uh, together. So there is a, a really purposeful harmony between even the successive notes of a melody, as the Greeks understood very well. So while we're not getting into all the nuts and bolts of how that overtone series is expressed in our Western musical system, which is used in the modes, there's a sense in which the physical natural reality is expressed in a particular way through this system, including through hierarchy and also just natural resonances, things that sound good together because they have a sort of, of commonality in wavelengths. Yeah, and it's uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things, interesting things that is different about modality from tonality is that the harmonies are between two pitches. In tonality, it's between three pitches, a triad. In modality, it's between two successive pitches, mostly thirds. So it's an interesting thing to think about that modes really progress by way of thirds. So if you sing, there you are with a D, an F to A. Om ne sindomi, A to C. And those harmonies are different, in a way, from the, the chordal harmonies of tonal music. They're more flexible, and they move more easily from one to the other. So there's a sort of enrichment of musical materials that's possible in using a modal system, because it's more diverse than our what you're referring to as the tonal system of major and minor. Exactly. If you look at the repertory of just the propers of the mass in chant, you find there are maybe five or six hundred pieces. There are only eight modes, and yet every one of those pieces is different. And they can be different because of the different ways in which the elements of those modes are used. So let's talk a little bit about the origin of this eight-mode system that we use in Gregorian chant. Uh, where did it come from, and how and when was it first applied to Gregorian chant? Yes, it's an interesting question, and scholars have speculated about that for a long time. One of the interesting features about the speculation is that if you study the music of the Mediterranean, that is to say, music cultures of all of the countries around the Mediterranean over history and in the present, you find that they all have one or another kind of eight-mode system. It's not the same systems, but they all have eight modes, and the systems are quite analogous, so that there is from antiquity, or from, in fact, before antiquity even maybe, there is a sense of what is what amounts to a diatonic system. And this is then related, can be related to the scales of the world, which are pentatonic. That is, five pitches make up the entire scale. And the modes of Western music simply have two more pitches in addition to those. So there is a kind of systematic and almost inevitable kind of, of relationship of pitches that then becomes more specified. The Greeks do something to specify it, and the, the monastic theorists of the Middle Ages pick up the Greeks' notions, and they begin to, well, before that, the Roman Christians are already singing in some kinds of modal system. And their pieces then are transmitted to the north, and the monastic theorists begin to apply the specific 
Greek names of modes and methods of analysis of modes. And that's what gives us our present eight mode system specifically and in detail. So you're talking about a repertory that existed before the eight modes were applied, but it already had some sort of eight mode undergirding. And then there was this interaction with the Greeks. I mean, how was it that these musicians had interaction with a Greek system? Well, they had a tradition of reading the Greek theorists. We never have had, except for one or two pieces, we never have had Greek music from antiquity. But we have an elaborate system of music theory from classical antiquity, from the Greeks. And so these were read, and various parts of them were adapted to their use, and that gave them the basis for making a theory of mode. Boethius was a help, but he got the system backwards, and so the modes that we have in the West are not quite the same as the Greek modes, <laughs> by mistake, but uh, that, that has given us a very clear system of modes. And so after these modes are applied in some sort of different way through this Greek system, we see a little bit of a change in composition style, right? That you can kind of tell the difference between chants that existed and then had the modal system applied versus the modal system is being used actively and new chants are being composed. Yes, you can. And uh, I, I'm not very good at dis discerning the the differences in style in the earliest pieces. But I think of Peter Jeffrey, who's one of the great scholars of Gregorian chant and of Byzantine chant as well, who has looked at the, gra the graduals of the mass and has said, these are from before the before Gregory, and these are from after Gregory. And these are from after a more clear definition of mode and so forth. So you can see some styles. I can see some styles in them. The most striking stylistic differences are when the chants are first defined by final and reciting note and melodic formulae that center around the final and the reciting note. That formula that I just sang to you, Gaudi Ahamo is a setting of notes around the final and around the reciting note. The final, B, C, D, and the reciting note, A, B flat, A. So that those two principal notes of the mode then give us the basis for melodic formulae. When they begin to define the, the modes theoretically, they begin to define all of the pitches of the scale not just the final and the reciting note, but fifths and fourths. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So fifths and fourths, at which point then the melodies begin to be centered more upon uh, those fifths and fourths. For instance, Victime Pascali Laudes, Emolent Christiani. There is a, a, a chant which is centered clearly on the fifth. On you say demi toves. The next part of it is centered upon the fourth above. But those those two elements of the theory of mode, the fourth and fifth, are a historical development that give rise or perhaps respond to uh, the use of those in actual composition of melodies. So if there was already some sort of system undergirding the chant from its earlier layers of existence, why was this Greek method applied? You know, what role did it play? Um, for example, did it have a role in the memorization and transmission processes of chant? Well, that's right. You need to, you need to have some kind of theory in order to memorize that immense repertory of chant so that the beginning figures, the one I just sang, is a clear identification of mode one, the Dorian mode, the authentic D mode, and that helps you to remember that chant. And 
also it suggests to you that there is that the rest of the chant is in the Dorian mode. It's going to be following through in with that scale. Even the identity of the mode of a, of a piece before any mod, melodic figure. If you, if you can remember that a piece is in a particular mode, you have a start at memorizing it. Uh, there's another factor in terms of defining the mode, and that is most chants would have been sung with verses, and the verses were chanted to psalm tones. And the psalm tones, there are only eight psalm tones, but you had to decide which one of those eight you had to use. And so that gives us then the definition of mode that is then a memory aid so that you can remember uh, which psalm tone you can use. So if you sang, then you would sing a psalm tone. Etc. So the psalm tones then were a motivation for classifying the chants, just so that you could remember which psalm tone to use along with which chant was memorized. There's another factor in the memorization of chant, and that is that the chants were taught to children. And children have the capacity for memorization that we lose somehow in the capacity for the memorization of a great quantity of material that we lose in middle adolescence. Uh, it's the same facility that the child has at learning a language without an accent. Children can speak foreign languages without an accent. And adults scarcely can without some very difficult exercise and work. So there's a difference that, that happens in middle adolescence. Uh, the brain is set, it begins to be set up differently, and it doesn't receive things as they are, but it receives things in terms of what it already knows. And so you get then, you, you, can't, you, 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 don't, you don't memorize things as easily. The child memorizes things easily. Of course, it's with a good deal of repetition, but those things which the child has memorized as a child, the child will have as an adult for a lifetime. And that was one of the secrets about the singing of chant in the liturgy, that the children learned it from memory and they had it for a lifetime. And the whole system of the singing of the liturgy depended upon people remembering all of those chants which they could do because they learned them as children. So could you talk at all about music that lies in a sort of modality that's auxiliary to these eight modes? For example, the tonus peregrinus. Are there things that relate to but don't quite fit in exactly the eight modes? Well, there are. As far as the mass chants, there's a small body of chants which appear to have been learned by tradition without specific reference to a modal theory and had to be accommodated to modal theory uh, later on. Let me find a, a chant that will, will show that very specifically. That would be in Advent. It is Urbs Fortitudinis, second Sunday of Advent in Vespers, and it goes, Urbs Fortitudinis Nostre Sion. Salvator con e turine amorus, et ante morale, aperite portas, qui an obiscum Deus, alleluia. If you had to analyze it, you'd have to say, that the first part of it is in a Dorian mode, and the second part of it is in a Mixolydian mode, because the scale at the beginning, Orbs fortitudinis nostre sion, salvator pone turine amors. V, E, F, G, A, there's your Dorian. But then, Aperite portas, qui an obiscum Deus, alleluia. Now there is a major mode. Ta -di -di. And what's wonderful about that is the text says, Zion, Jerusalem, a 
a city of our strength, the Savior is placed there as a wall and as a guardian. Open the gates, for our God is coming to be with us. And at aperite portas, the mode changes. So you had had aperite portas. So uh, the change in mode actually represents a change in the meaning of the text, which is fundamental to the season of Advent, which it represents. So I think you bring out wonderfully in your writing and your your talks the fact that text painting, as we think about it from a, a Renaissance and later sort of perspective, where the music somehow graphically or orally represents the text in some way, is more rare in Gregorian chant. But um, what you're saying here is that modal change is a sort of way of text painting that is sometimes occurring in the repertory. Yeah. You see, you do have you do have in uh, in lots of pieces the use of a spatial analogy as text painting. In in other words, when the text says "ascendit," the melody goes up, and "they shendit," it goes down. Uh, but there's an absolutely wonderful example of the uh, the use of that at the communion antiphon "Tolite ostias." And that is a mode four, bridge and mode chant. And there's the final. The characteristic of the bridge and mode is there's a half step above the final, which gives it a very distinctive sound, a different kind of harmony. So bring offerings and enter into his courts. Adore the Lord in his holy hall. Adorate Domino in a tria el sancta eus. So that chant then represents Adorate Domini, the gesture of adoration is one of bowing down, and the chant itself bows down from places that you don't expect it to go. You expect it to center around its final, but in fact, all of a sudden, you actually go to a note that's outside the defined range of the mode even, to represent the gesture of adoration. So there are all of these wonderful things that the chant can show forth about the text. The simplest aspect of the text is parallelism, so that every psalm verse, and most of the chants are based on psalm verses, every psalm verse is comprised of two complete statements that are complementary. And so if you have Psalm 109 for the Feast of Apostles, Juravit Dominus, Juravit Dominus, et non penite biteum. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent of it. That's a complete statement. Tu es sacerdos in aeternum, thou art a priest forever. Juravit Dominus, et non penite biteum. Tu es sacerdos in aeternum. So that parallelism, those two complementary statements are one, the narration that the Lord has sworn, and the second is what the Lord has sworn. Thou art a priest forever. And this is then applied to an apostle. But the musical representation of it is 
to differentiate those two phrases by the range of the melody. So that the second part, what the Lord has sworn, is in the lower part of the range, whereas the narrative is in the upper part. And the lower part of the range, the words of the Lord are set to a lower pitch to represent the gravity and the dignity of the words of the Lord. And you find a lot of chants in which quite quote the words of the Lord in a way that represent the gravity and the dignity of the Lord's words. So just in the same way that with the tonal system of major and minor, any masterful composer can use the system in surprising ways that are not sort of cookie cutter style. That happens in the Gregorian repertory too, right? I mean, I think so often of times that I'm, I'm encountering an offertory piece and you think it's going one place and then all of a sudden it sounds so different than any other piece in the repertory because of how it uses the mode. Absolutely. That example that I just sang, Tolite Osteos, uh, where it, uh, it all of a sudden goes down to represent adoration. Lots of chants will do that. Likewise, chants will do things that you don't expect from the mode. The Phrygian mode is sometimes thought of as sorrowful, but listen to the communion for the second mass of Christmas. Exalt, O daughter of Zion. Praise, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes, holy and a savior of the world. Exalt, There is that Phrygian cadence, the half step going down, Mundi. And yet, the whole figure, all of the melodic figures, express exultation. So there's a wonderful way in which each mode can be used in so many various ways, depending upon how the figuration is placed around the pitches of the mode. I did want to circle around to an issue that I know probably a lot of our listeners are interested in, and that is your use of the words Dorian, Phrygian, ah. Lydian, Mixolydian. Are those anachronistic or, um, you know, of course, you can refer to it in just the numbers, the more ancient uh, appellation to Produce, Deuterus, etc., where do those uh, Greek-sounding names originate, and are they properly apply, applied or only anachronistically? Well, they're applied uh, anachronistically in both directions. They are ancient, and the med medievals generally use numbers, modes one through eight, or they numbered the finals, Protus, Deutus, Tritus, Tetrardus, the Greek names for one, two, three, four, or first, second, third, and fourth. But the Greeks already used place names, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, and then for some reason there's a mixture that gives the name Mixolydian, and those names were always known as transmitted as Greek names. And in the Renaissance, in order to make things look more Greek, because it was fashionable to make things look more Greek, so to show that you knew the classical language, they readopted those Greek names specifically, uh, m much more so in the Renaissance than in the Middle Ages. So the use of the, the Greek names are anachronistic, both forward and backwards. <laughs> so I'd like to move into just a little bit more of a sort of personal take on the modes. And I'm wondering, you know, after having sung chant for so many decades, 
what do you hear in the color or feel or taste of individual modes? What, what are some things that stand out to you as particularly interesting or savory? Well, you see, each mode has a kind of a basic harmony and a, a basic sort of potential affect. So I think of uh, the introit for the Requiem Mass, for instance. Mode six, a major mode that is all conjunct motion, that is conducive to a sense of exactly what the text is praying for, eternal rest. Requiem eternum, donaeis, domine. That chant is so archetypal and so free, has been so frequently used for funeral masses that even people today who have no, no more experience of the chant used in the Mass can remember and identify with the Requiem Mass. Or the examples that I showed you, the Phrygian mode of exulta filia sion. Or here's another one that is quite funny in a way. We just came across this on the Epiphany, the communion for Epiphany. It's, again, Phrygian, mode four, and it's the words of the three kings. We have seen his star in the east, and we have come with gifts to adore the Lord. And what you have there, again, a Phrygian chant, but now Phrygian is being used to depict something foreign. That is to say, you have, you have in art history the use of a Phrygian cap. That's a hat that is not like hats that are worn in the West, but in the, East, in the East. And characters who are supposed to be foreigners are given Phrygian caps, so you can tell that they're supposed to be foreigners. Well, the Phrygian mode, in the words of the three kings, we have seen his star in the East, is a very strange construction of the melody. It leaps up through four different pitches in a row in the same direction, something that is completely unheard of in chant melody. So from and then in Oriente. So there are funny leaps that are strange and have been described by medieval theorists as solecisms, that is, ungrammatical uses of melody. This is a way of depicting the strangeness of the three kings who have come from, and it's, it's at the point where it says they have come from the east. And just to, just to interject a moment, you, you see that in so much of the visual iconography of the Three Kings as well, that precisely that's right. it's that, that cap that has that funny little uh, twist at the top, right? That's right, exactly. That's your Phrygian cap. But what happens in the second part of this chant, Adorare We have come to adore the Lord. On adore the Lord, is the most close-in, beautiful, normal way of representing the Phrygian mode. So, Stellum Eius in Oriente is strange, and Adore the Lord is beautiful and familiar. It's a beautiful way of making a distinction, and it's done to texts that are very parallel. We have seen, and we have come. We have seen his star in the east, 
and we have come with gifts to adore the Lord. So there's the parallelism that you get as a very characteristic of the texts of the chants. Isn't there a way, too, in which the um, sort of big motives that stand out in our memory and how they fit into a mode gives color to the mode and to the feast? You know, for example, the mode in Puer Natus Est or the mode in Factus Est Repente for Pentecost. Yes. Well, interestingly, you mentioned two chants which, uh, which have, uh, have a, the fifth, the interval of the fifth in the Mixolydian mode. But that fifth can also be used in the Dorian mode, where it's in the con I mean Huanatus is in the in the context of the Missolydian mode, in which the chant will then fill in the notes of the major mode. Puhenatus says and then down through there to the major scale. But you can also have it on the Dorian mode. Uh, uh, but you see, we have a kind of a, a modern identification of the minor mode. Uh, that is, a Dorian is a minor mode because it has a third, a minor third above the final. D E F. There's a minor third. When you have that in harmonized music, there's a there's a little bit of a dissonance to the minor third uh, harmonically that gives us the element of sadness. That element of sadness is not present in the chant because those notes are not sung simultaneously in a triad, but rather that chant will shift up to the third F to A, which is a major mode. God he amos. FGA is then the center, and that's a major mode anyway. So you see, there is a wonderful complex of colors that is part of the modal system. It's not just one mode and one color, but where the chant goes in the middle of its progress gives us the complexity and the color and the beauty and the sense of purpose and order that is so important to the liturgy. So in a sense, understanding the modality of a chant is a sort of key to unlocking the meaning and the rhetorical expression of the chant. But there's also this practical element to modality that we've been talking about. And I'd like to just circle around back to that to conclude. You know, what are the benefits that accrue to singers of chant in learning the modes? And could you maybe recommend some exercises they might employ to help them remember the modes and make them useful in reading and singing chant? Yes. Uh, I think one of the things that you can do is to have some paradigms of the mode. I have put together a set of eight antiphons that represent the eight modes. The antiphons are relatively simple chants, including the one that I sang about uh, Uravit Dominus. And if you if you take those eight mo eight chants, and I, I've given them to to Jennifer so that she can uh, put them up on her website, and you can access them if if she can do that, and sing those through, and sing them often, and sing them a lot, and you'll become become familiar with the differences between the modes. I find that singing a chant over and over and over again is the best way to learn it. Repetitio mater studiorum. Repetition is the mother of learning. But also another way to do it is to copy music. J.S. Bach copied enormous volumes of music. He copied Frescobaldi's Fiori Musicali, a book of organ masses, complete. And then he wrote some pieces that, in fact, show that he understood what Frescobaldi was doing in those pieces. He copied music incessantly and was not just to copy it, it was to perform it, but to learn how to, to get an italic pen and learn how to copy it in square notation is a way of coming to terms with the very innards of a chant. 
in a different way. So copy it and sing it. Sing it while you're copying it. Sing, Gaudiamus, and then make the square notes that go up and make the B flat. And all of that is a, a way of learning the modes. Thanks so much, Bill. This has been really enlightening and entertaining uh, in so many details that you've been able to to give to our listeners, perhaps that have known about modality and, and uh, just kind of fill it in with some of the historical context and sort of historical baubles <laughs> in, in the history. Um, and also just to our listeners in understanding the meaning of Gregorian chant. You know, we, we probably listeners of this podcast prize Gregorian chant as the, the music of the Roman rite and have a love for hearing it actually in the mass. But it might feel still a little bit like an unlocked mystery to us without really being able to dive in. And you've definitely given us some tools to be able to dive in more deeply today. My pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to access the handouts that Dr. Mart was referring to in his discussion of modes, check out our website, sacredmusicpodcast.com. Click on episodes and find season three, episode seven. And until the next episode, may we sing the praise of his glory. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Heck Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Scola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole, from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is the first movement of Trio Sonata No. 6 in G Major by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Peter Carter. We look forward to having you join us next time, and until then, may we sing the praise of His glory.